we used to live, in, you know, when I want to talk about platforms, part of what I'd like to do is put the context of why platforms today and whether those platforms are different from what we've been used to as platforms. And in the next 14 minutes or so, we'll try to build that story, uh, hopefully eliciting some form of, of spark of, of different thinking about platforms. For most of our lives as human beings, we've lived and died within a 10, 15 mile radius of where we were born. Right? Human society, particularly settled society post our hunter-gatherer status, used to fundamentally stay within the villages and towns. We knew everybody. Trust levels and business were high. You knew who you were dealing with. You knew where they came from. You knew what their interests and preferences were. You knew what the risks of doing business were. You had real relationships and real friendships. Then something happened. Suddenly, over a short period of time, towards the middle of the Industrial Revolution, we went through a whole series of acquisitions of technology which made it possible for human beings to afford migration. The cost of migration plummeted, and then suddenly we found ourselves able to move from where we were and running away in all kinds of directions to a point where we began to celebrate not knowing our neighbor. I'm not sure we would call that civilization, but we actually reached that point. There was a diaspora all over the world, and that was the defining characteristic of the last 100 years or so. And then, particularly over the last 20 years, we've seen something else happen. After the diaspora has come a reconnection. The Friendster, the Friends Reunited, the Facebook, all these building on the telephony and telegraph and mail and the, the kind of constructs that came to us towards the latter stages of the industrial age as we moved into the information age, created a, an environment where now everybody is connected. And the first theme I want to lay across in order to explain this, the, the nature of how platforms are evolving is that there is a renaissance taking place. This is not something new. As soon as human beings could connect to each other affordably, they recreated the very social fabric that had been torn during human migration becoming affordable. Migrate, affordable, diaspora. Reconnect, affordable, bring back together. Except that this bringing back together was a logical reconnection rather than a physical reconnection. Right? It's like saying when I watch television, which I never really did, but if I had watched television when I was young, if it had existed in India when I was growing up, I would have watched it in the living room with everybody else in the family, only being able to watch what my father chose if he had the remote control in this hypothetical environment. Now my daughter watches television with her friends, logically connected while they are wherever they are, and it's that change that we have to understand. Physical separation with logical reconnection because that is dominating how humans are behaving today. We may say that that's creating a whole level of isolation, right? We may say that it reaches a stage where nobody has a first life anymore, they've only got a second life. But the truth is, every technology of communications, even broadcast technologies, created levels of separation before as people learned about the new technology. Today, unlike when I was growing up, we live in streams of engagement with information. When you want to build platforms, you need to understand this incredible change that has taken place in a short period of time, where whether it's a Facebook or a LinkedIn or a Twitter or a chatter at Salesforce, what we're actually doing is completely changing the consumption paradigm for information. 
We live in streams. Okay? When I started work, I had green screens. I was just at the edge of having to use punched cards. And everything to do with technology was at scarcity level. So you threw away as much data as early as possible. The platforms of the day were designed to throw data away, saying, validate at the start, reject, compress as quickly as possible, store the summary as quickly as possible, because CPU cycles, storage, memory, all that was really expensive. So we designed for that context of scarcity of technology in every part of computing, whether it's compute or storage or bandwidth. Today, it's different. Today, the term people use is bring me the fire hose, because our ability to be able to deal with fire hoses has become that much more possible. So imagine the, the sort of the backdrop, all wanting to be reconnected after 150, 200 years of diaspora, and all wanting to be able to consume fire hoses compared to the extreme scarcity levels of 35, 40 years ago. That living in the stream mindset, which has to characterize how platforms get built, will now take you through how these platforms work. One of the first things that happens with the platforms of today is that you're able to shift place and time. Right? We have TARDIS type effects in what we're doing because when you're always connected, the reason why my children have viewing habits that are different from broadcast habits is that the ability to shift place and time has changed dramatically. You know, when I started work, if I got a phone call and I wasn't there, I didn't get that phone call. And it was a very slow period of time to say, if someone else picks up that phone, they're going to take a message and I can pick up the analog message from my desk to today, where I'm reachable, if I so choose, wherever I am 24 hours a day. The, the, the development of networks, the development of compute power, the bringing together of historical three disciplines, that of computing, that of telephony and communications, and that of embedded systems, has reached a hyperconnected world where now it is really possible for me to do that. But that alone is not necessarily important. What really starts getting interesting is that the way we engage with any form of life, we've now begun to go into a TiVoing, right? You can decide to record something at one point and replay it later. The platforms that you work with have to make it possible for you to be able to make that. It happened at one time, I can record it, I can store it, and I can replay it at a different time and in a different place. How you work, how you study, how you learn, all these things are showing this distributed reconnect capacity and the underlying capacity to change space and time. That alone would not be enough because when we do this, if we live with broadcast mindsets, then we're missing the key point of what living in a stream represents. One of the biggest shifts in switching to this sort of stream kind of behavior is the avoidance of swivel chair integration. Okay? 15 years ago, if somebody wanted to tell me about a book to read, a song to listen to, a film to watch, they would send me an email if they and I were connected, and we were lucky enough to have devices that would provide that service wherever I was. It was just emerging. But all I get is the text. Today, what you expect the platform to be able to do is to say, send me the recommendation with a sample of what you'd like me to listen to so that I can press that link and listen to it exactly where I am. And if I like it, let me do something about it. The alert is not the value. The recommendation is not the value. The ability in situ to take action when needed so that you don't batch a whole series of actions to say, I will do it some other time, because we all know what happened when we said that. Nothing happened. So the value proposition of being able to live in the stream is to be able to act within the stream. Now I need a link that says, you send me something to review, 
I want to be able to click on it, try it. If I like it, I want to rent it, buy it, send it somewhere else. All these actions have to be doable within the stream. If I'm at work and I get an expense claim and I want to improve it, the fact that the expense claim comes to me by email is an irrelevance because what am I going to do with it? Stop what I'm doing, swivel chair integrate, walk to somewhere else, and do that? No way was I going to do it. I'm going to batch it. And then the day gets busy and I don't do anything about it. And we create all these wastages of time and how we work because of it. The other big change that takes place is we're no longer using the keyboard. That's my cat, Lily. She knows how to use an iPad. What's relevant is it's not a cat. What's relevant is the reason why she can do it. No keyboard. Right? This artifact of 100 years that came in the way of human beings engaging with technology is on its way out. Now we use sound and touch and gesture, maybe even sight to be able to do things. Another friction removed, more people empowered. For a platform to work, it's not just mobile, able to shift time and place with actionable alerts, but able to be engaged with using whatever sense you want to use at the time. The most relevant sense for the form factor and context, rather than where is my keyboard. Okay? Platforms need to be able to support that and design that. And it's not enough to build the architectures of the past, which were fundamentally monolithic and deep vertical integration of a single source. Because over time, a monolithic architecture decays in its ability to change. Over time, the pace of change of a monolithic architecture will die. You need to build ecos ecosystems. You need to build APIs. You need to be able to attract partners to be able to work with it. But now what happens to the stream that you work with as part of the platform is that the stream becomes a semi-permeable membrane. You need to be able to drop securely actions that emerge, alerts that emerge from elsewhere into the stream. And you need to take out securely actions and alerts that would move to some other part of, the, of your environment as safely and securely. So the existence of APIs and publishers as part and parcel of how the platform works is a critical part of how we would move the platform thinking forward. The ability to subscribe to those alerts as part of the ecosystem, to allow the ecosystem to develop services that you would not be able to do as the monolith is part of how you feature-proof, part of how you are able to create that low cost of change that you would otherwise have been able to have problems with in the monolith. When all these things are connected, obviously you need to be able to, to understand and create value from the data that is coming out of it. And that's not a trivial exercise, so the platform needs to be able to support the analytics of how to create and extract insights from that data. That needs to be personalized and driven, which requires the metadata to be understood about person, location, time zone, label, etc. And it needs to be done at speed in real time, because the batching structures of the past are over. To summarize, the platforms of today need to be ecosystems that provide you streams that you can live in, streams that allow you to drop the alerts and the action mechanisms from outside the stream into the stream safely and securely, streams that allow the extraction of alerts and recommendations from within the stream to some other context safely and securely, done in a way to support an ecosystem, done in a way that represents the ability to personalize to the individual in device, in time, and in location, and to do all this with no loss of friction in terms of the time it would take in the past. This is the world we live in today. This is the future that is already here, but unevenly distributed, as William Gibson would say. And every time we want to build platforms, this is what we need to think about. Thank you for your time.